Let's open our Bibles here to Romans chapter number 12. Romans chapter number 12. As we get ready to get started here, I want to have you ponder a couple of questions. The first one is, why do you do what you do as a Christian? You know, as a Christian, why is it that you do what you do? Why do you serve how you serve? Why do you witness? Why do you read your Bible and pray? What's the motivation behind all those things? So why do you do it? And then what is it that motivates and empowers you to do what you do? There's a lot of different reasons that somebody might give to those questions. Some are motivated by guilt. They have a hard time coming to the conclusion that, yes, Jesus did pay for all my sins. He has forgiven me of everything. And because of some sort of guilt within them, they feel like I have to serve, I have to work, I have to do. And so because of guilt, they do certain things. They serve in certain positions or whatever else. Um, that's not the proper motive for serving the Lord and doing what He wants us to do, because the Bible tells us that if we trust Jesus, that He has taken our sins and separated them as far as the east is from the west, that He's buried them deeper than the deepest sea, that if we confess our sin, He's faithful and just to forgive us our sin and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. So guilt is not a reason to serve the Lord. Uh, some people are motivated by legalism. That if I just keep certain rules, if I follow certain guidelines, whether for salvation itself or to keep my salvation, see, that's what legalism is. Legalism is not just having standards or those sorts of things. Legalism is adding to salvation. So whether it's I have to add to get it or I have to add to keep it. And some people are motivated by that. Even though the scripture tells us in John chapter number 10, no man is able to pluck them out of my hands. That we are safe and secured. Uh, maybe like that little song, signed, sealed, and delivered. Uh, we can't lose our salvation. But some people, because of maybe taking some scriptures out of context or pulling one verse out here or something like that, they, they feel like, I've got to follow the rules... Or I'm out. Unfortunately, there's some families that operate that way. God's family doesn't operate that way. If you're his child, you're his child. And just because you sin or just because you make a mistake or just because you fail doesn't mean you're not his child anymore. But sadly, a lot of people are motivated by legalism. Some are motivated by selfishness. They serve because they want recognition, because they want authority, they want prominence, they want to be in the limelight or rewards or whatever else that they think that goes along with this. Uh, in, in our morning life group, we were in Numbers chapter number 16 the last couple of weeks looking at that rebellion with Coram and Dathan and Abiram. And man, they, they just wanted the position that Moses and Aaron had. They wanted the prominence. They weren't satisfied with where God had put them to serve. They wanted so much more. And man, isn't that exactly what the devil wanted? Wasn't content just leading worship for God. He wanted to be the one that was worshipped. And some people are motivated. The only reason they serve, the only reason they get involved in ministry or whatever else or do anything is so they can get recognition. Man, there are some great people out there that they serve and they help and they do things and, and they don't want anybody to know. They, they, they sacrifice and nobody knows. And man, what, what prominent and important people and will be rewarded by God because the scripture tells us we can have our reward from men or our reward from God. If you want to live for the public and, and be a praise of men, then you have your reward, the Bible tells us or you can choose to have your reward from God. God can reward far greater than any man can. Some people, that's the motivating factor for why they serve and why they worship, why they come to church or whatever else. It's just pure selfishness for why they do what they do. 
But as Christians, we have something far better than these to motivate and empower us. That is the word grace. And we have spent this month talking about grace and how powerful and how important and wonderful and amazing that it is. We first of all talked about saving grace. The Bible says that we are saved by grace through faith. It's not of ourselves. It is a gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. And the only way any of us ever come to Jesus Christ is through His grace. Him pouring out the blessings and the good things that I do not deserve. The only thing that I deserve, the only thing that you deserve, is to burn forever in the lake of fire. That's what the Bible tells us. That's what we all deserve. So if you want to get what you deserve, you can't. You're going to pay for it. Or we can accept the gift that that Jesus has to offer. Because He's already paid the price for your sin. He's already paid the price for my sin. That's why He came to this earth. That's why He hung on that cross and bled and died. Well, so He could pay the price for our sins. But thank God He didn't stay dead. He rose again. And 1 Corinthians 15 tells us because of that we can have everlasting life. And that's the gift that He offers. He offers a gift of saving grace. If you're here and you've never trusted Jesus, I want you to know He loves you and He wants to give you something. He's not, he doesn't want something from you. He wants to give you something. And he wants to give you the greatest gift that you could ever have. Salvation by grace through faith. And so we talked about that saving grace. Then we talked about saying grace. We're not talking about saying some prayer before we eat. I think that's a good idea to pray along with your meal. Some people pray before. Some people eat the meal and decide exactly how much they want, thanks they want to get, give afterward, depending on how good it was or wasn't. It. But, you know... We're not talking about that. We're talking about the words that we say. The Bible says that our words ought to be always with grace, seasoned with salt. Remember that word grace is the idea of blessings people don't deserve. So out of our lips ought to flow all kind of blessings to everybody that we talk to. Everybody that hears the sound of our voice ought to be blessed by the words that we say and how we say it. Because... The words don't mean anything if we say it the wrong way. I can say I love you in a lot of different ways. Many of those don't mean a thing based upon how I say them. And so there are people that, you know what, we could say I, they deserve for me to chew them out. They deserve harsh words because of what they've done and how they've responded. The Bible says as a Christian, that's not our call to make. We're to, we're to let no corrupt communication proceed out of our mouth, Ephesians 4 tells us, but that which is good to the use of edifying, that it may minister grace to the hearers, the Bible says. So even though we may think that somebody deserves harsh words, deserves for us, we will justify it in telling this person off because of what they've done, the Bible says, no, not for you, not if you're a Christian. You're to speak words of grace, words that bless, that encourage and build up. And so we spent some time talking about saying grace. Then last week we looked at suffering grace. In that uh, instance, as the Apostle Paul in the book of uh, Corinthians tells us, that he prayed three times for the Lord to take away this thorn in the flesh, this messenger of Satan that would buffet him. God said, no, I'm not going to. Man, there's times where we pray and we ask God, Lord, please heal, please fix, please solve, please take away. And God says, yes, I will. Man, what a great thing that is. But sometimes the greatest thing God can do for us is tell us no. Sometimes the best thing for him to do is to tell us no. And here Paul asked three times, Lord, please take this away. And like I said, there's a lot of debate about what the thorn in the flesh is. It's foolishness to spend a lot of time debating things the Scripture doesn't tell us what it is. God said, no, I'm not going to take it away. I'm going to do something even better than take it away. I'm going to pour out my grace on your life. I'm going to give you what you need to be able to handle it. And remember, I mentioned that little saying that people often throw around. God won't give you more than you can handle. That's a lie. 
God often gives us more than we can handle. He gave the Apostle Paul more than he could handle in 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse number 8, where he says, I was pressed down above measure to the point that I despaired even of life, he said. He said, but I had this sentence of death for a reason that I would learn not to trust me. I would learn to trust God. Sometimes God puts the pressure down on us so that we'll learn to trust him. And here, God said, I'm not going to take it away. I'm going to do something far greater. I'm going to give you grace to be able to handle the situation. My grace, as we just heard that song said, is, my, is sufficient, God told Paul. It's everything that you need and more. So I don't know the difficulties that you're facing. I don't know the hardship, but the Bible says we can come boldly to the throne of grace and get exactly what we need to go and to face these hard times. And so suffering grace is what we talked about last time. And here this morning for a little while, we want to talk about serving grace. Serving grace. Look at Romans chapter number 12. Beginning in verse number 4 says this, For as we have many members in one body, and all members have not the same office, so we being many are one body in Christ, and every one member is one of another having then gifts differing according to the grace that is given to us, whether prophecy let us prophesy according to the proportion of faith, or ministry let us wait on our ministering, or he that teacheth on teaching, or he that exhorteth on exhortation, he that giveth let him do it with simplicity, he that ruleth with diligence, he that showeth mercy with cheerfulness. Let's pray. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word this morning. Lord, thank you for these things that we have been learning about concerning grace. And Lord, whatever the area of grace that we need today, I pray that you would give it to us. You told us we can come boldly to the throne of grace and receive what we need. And Lord, I pray for those that may be here this morning and have never trusted Jesus Christ to be their Savior. Lord, I don't know the circumstance that might bring somebody here for the first time. Lord, there's a reason for it. I believe you're working and you're moving and you're trying to reach them. And God, I pray that today would be the day they'd put their faith and trust in Jesus Christ and they'd experience that saving grace. Lord, for some, maybe have a hard time with the words that they say. Their words are destructive and they tear down. Lord, I pray that you would bestow upon each of us a supernatural saying grace. That the words that we say would administer blessing. They'd build up and not tear down and destroy. And Lord, maybe some need suffering grace. Lord, they're hurting and they're facing a hard time. And Lord, that you would just give them that grace that is sufficient for them, that is everything that they need this morning. And Lord, maybe somebody here needs some serving grace. They need to understand what it means not to do things in our own strength, talent, and ability, but, Lord, to use the power and the grace that you give to us to accomplish the work that you want us to accomplish. Lord, work in our hearts as only you can. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So we began by thinking about these different questions, why we do what we do. What is it that motivates and empowers us? And a lot of different reasons like we talked about, but the thing that ought to motivate and empower each of us as Christians is that word grace. There's, as I mentioned in the beginning of this series, there's more to grace than just salvation. Our experience with grace as a Christian begins at salvation. When God does that great work and we're born again, but grace doesn't stop there. It doesn't end there. It continues to flow and to work and move and empower us to do everything that God wants us to do. And uh, so before we get and talk about empowered by grace, let's look at motivated by grace. When I stop and I think about everything that God has done for me, as I mentioned a moment ago, I don't deserve any good thing. You don't deserve any good thing. I don't even know some of you here today very well, but I understand you don't, you don't deserve any good thing. I don't deserve any good thing. Every good thing that happens in my life is simply God pouring out His grace on my life. 
every good thing that ever happens to you is because God has poured out His grace on your life. And man, we, we get such a wrong perspective sometimes, especially as Americans, because we're so blessed, we have so much. Man, I, I, I love going to other countries. I love talking to other people from other countries who understand what it means to suffer and have need and to do without because we're so spoiled here. And we get this mentality that we're entitled to absolutely everything. It's one of the greatest problems of our, of our country has been success and wealth. It's been one of the greatest scourges on the, on the Christian movement. Why? Because we feel like we deserve everything. And then when we don't get what we think that we deserve, we're quick to blame God. You know, things don't work out exactly like I want them to. Well, God, why did you do this to me? Like, I deserve better than this. You don't deserve better. I don't deserve better. Remember, we do not want what we deserve. If I get what's fair, if I get what I deserve, I'm right this second in the lake of fire. That's what I deserve. And what I deserve doesn't change just because I'm a pastor of a church, by the way. I deserve eternity in the lake of fire. That's what you deserve. So, any second I'm not there is God's mercy poured out. That's the bad things that I don't deserve. Okay, But any good thing that happens to me is God's grace. Every time I breathe air into these lungs, that's God's grace. Miss Wanda will tell you, every time this heart beats, God's grace pumping through those veins, giving us another second of life. All the good times we spend with family, friends, church, it's God's grace. All the relationships that we have in our life, it's God's grace. Every good thing, and man, now there's a song, Counting Every Blessing. Man, if we took time to count every blessing, we'd be here a long time. And all those things are just God pouring out His grace onto our lives. And when I began to think about all the good things, and man, some of you, I think about my kids, and man, what a blessing, my wife, parents. We had our father-son cookout, and we shared some testimonies and memories from you know, our, our relationship with our fathers and those things. And man, what a blessing those things are. Some of you have grandkids and Man, the blessing that comes from that, you say it's even a greater blessing than having children themselves. You know, all the fun and all the enjoyment. You don't have to worry about the responsibility and the headache and all those things. What blessings? It's God's grace. Man, He's so good. We often sing that song, God is so good. He's so good to me and how true it is. And shame on us when we forget that just because things don't always go the way we want them to. Just because things don't always turn out the way I expect them to or would like them to. God has been very gracious to me. God has been very gracious to you. And if there's no other reason to serve Him other than His grace, that's enough. And you ought to be motivated to get busy for the cause of Christ, to do what He wants you to do simply because of the grace that He gives you every single day. Every day you wake up, it's God's grace, and you ought to seek to do something for Him because of it. You ought to seek to reach people with the gospel of Christ. Why? That way they can know His grace. They can experience the goodness of God that they don't deserve. It's so interesting to me to have different conversations with different people as I'm out about and... This was, a, this was an interesting series to be inviting people to because they, most people have heard that song, Amazing Grace. In fact, uh, this past week as I was inviting a lady to come, I handed her the card and said, hey, our church is doing this series on Amazing Grace. I want to invite you to come. She looked at the card, was kind of interested. She said, you know, this, this was the first song played at my, my mother's funeral. I said, really? She said, it's a good song, isn't it? Man, God's grace. A lot of people know God's grace, but we don't think about it enough. Man, what a great motivating factor just to tell somebody, hey, God's grace is available to you. 
And so we, we need to be motivated by that. Not just motivated by grace, but empowered by grace. And here as we read Romans chapter number 12, he has this conversation about the church that uh, he references in pictures like a body. He says, just like the body has many members, the church has many members. And in other places he talks about how the body is members are all different created different, to do different things. And man, I can't stand going to a church where they try to push everybody into one press and make them one thing. You know, you go to a place and it's like they're trying to make everybody just like the pastor. You don't want to be like this pastor, I will tell you that right now. You don't want to make, everybody don't want to be like this. It would be a horrible place to be. But God created each of us, he, he loves variety. All you have to do is look at creation. Take one flower, not even all the flowers. You take one flower and look at the different varieties there are in color and all kinds of things. I don't know a lot about flowers, but I know there's a lot of different ones. I, I can't name them. I, I enjoy the beauty and all those sorts of things, but God loves variety. God did not create us or save us to be all the same. He created us all differently. He created us uniquely. And that is a great thing. When you have all these different personalities, all these different talents and abilities that come together for one purpose, you're able to reach a lot more people that way. You're able to do a lot more than if just everybody is exactly the same. And so here he's describing it as a body. He says, just like we have a body, and all of the members of our body don't hold the same office, they don't all do the same thing. He says, so we, talking about the church being many, are one body in Christ, and every one member is one of another. And how important that is. You're not alone. You're not alone, and what you do doesn't just affect you. Just like my body. They're different members, but they're not alone. And what I do with one hand can severely hurt the other. Where I go with my feet can severely hurt the rest of my body, depending upon where I'm going and what I'm doing. And the same is true for each of us. So what I do can severely hurt you if I'm not doing what I'm supposed to be doing, living how I'm supposed to live. I can also have an effect positively on one another as well so we're members one of another and let's not lose sight of that he says having then gifts differing according to the what right, let's try that again everybody's a little sleeping <laughs> having then gifts differing according to the grace. the grace gifts differing according to the grace so in other words, God blesses us with these different gifts. And then he goes on to describe what some of those gifts are. He says, gift of prophecy, let us prophesy according to the proportion of faith. The gift of ministry, let us wait on our ministering. The gift of teaching on teaching. The gift of exhortation in verse number 8 on exhortation. That's the idea of encouraging or building up. The gift of giving. Let him do it with simplicity. The gift of ruling with diligence. The gift of mercy says with cheerfulness. So, And I don't think this is an exhaustive list by any means. He's giving us some examples here that says God pours out his grace on each of us to give us exactly what we need to serve in the body of Christ. And just as God designed the human body, man, you go back to the book of Genesis and you read how God is speaking all these different things. We talked about the flowers and man, God spoke the flowers and the plants and all that to existence, the mountains and seas, all the animals and everything else. God speaks it all into existence. And then it's time to make man. God does something quite different and unique. And anytime God changes the pattern, we ought to take notice because there's a reason for it. 
And instead of saying, let there be man, in some way, shape, or form, however God can, he gets down and he forms man out of the ground. Then breathes into man the breath of life and he becomes a living soul. There's something very special and unique about humanity, about being a human. God loves humans. I don't get it. Most of the time, I don't love humans, and I'm one of them. (laughs) Most of the time, people don't love this human because I'm not very lovable. But God loves humans. God loves you. He desires a relationship with you. I don't understand why God would desire a relationship with me, but he does. There's something special about us. God was forming man and creating hands and feet and all this stuff. He creates it very specially, uniquely, and man, when he gets done, God beholds and he says, it's very good. It's very good. He created man in such a way that we could have a relationship with him. We could know him. Of course, that was marred because of man's choice to sin. That's why Jesus came to offer that saving grace so that relationship can be restored. But he's created very wonderfully and uniquely. God created ears to do certain things, that is, to hear. He created mouths to speak and to eat and to drink. Hands to be able to grab things and to work and to do things and to play and feet to move and to go. He knew exactly what he was doing when he was designing this body. It's been so interesting to look throughout history and see how Man's intellect is finally caught up with what God had done. You know, throughout history, they'll talk about these vestigial organs that are basically worthless and just kind of in there. And as man begins, continues to learn, he finds out there's nothing useless thrown in the body. There are things we can live without, nothing useless. They all have a purpose and they all have a job, something to do. Man, the church is just like that. He knows exactly what this church needs to take care of itself, to heal when there are wounds. He gives the body exactly what it needs, and he gifts us to do that. He pours out his grace on some lives and gives them the gift of mercy. And then he gives, pours out on some, he says, the gift of serving. He, see, he gives us exactly what we need at the time. And there are times where we need to be corrected. God pours out and gives the gift that the church needs. He's given us everything that we need to help each other, to support one another to equip each other to reach this community with the gospel of Christ. He pours out that grace on all of our lives. You know, I think about Moses, and we don't have time to turn there, but Moses is, you know, God is the one who raised him up. And I I love that illustration as Moses is making all these excuses. God, I don't know what to say and all this. I, I don't know necessarily that the excuses he gave were really valid. I think there was maybe a little bit of fear based upon his past, but God looked at him and said, Moses, who made your mouth? How how are you going to tell the one who created your mouth, Lord, I can't speak? I can't say anything. God created your mouth. He knows how it works. He knows how it operates. God equips us and gives us exactly what we need to serve him. I've stated on a number of occasions, if it were just my choice, I wouldn't be a pastor. I would be in a room alone somewhere by myself and maybe speak to like three humans. That, that would be about it. Whichever, I, I, there'd be a quota. My wife could come in and talk to her and then only two girls a day maybe. 
just teasing. I love my girls. But in my own strength and talent and ability, I can't do this. I can't be a pastor. And I remember when Pastor Plinus, he's on vacation this week, pray that they would have a good time and a safe time and refreshed and all those things. But I remember when he came and told me, I'm retiring. You know, would you consider, and, and, I'm, and then he told me two weeks, and I'm like, I just don't know if I'm ready. I, I, Lord, I can't do it. And I remember even on the, the, the time, we had, a, we had a lock-in that night as he was retiring December 31st. I was going to take over responsibilities as voted upon by this congregation January 1st, midnight. And I just remember as soon as that clock rolled around, the weight that fell upon me. Lord, I can't do this. What in the world have I done? What have you done? Like, <laughs> but the Lord pours out grace. And he gives us the strength that we need when we need it. And there were things that I went through in the early days where God just gave the strength that I needed at the right time. And then there were things that happened later on that were harder to deal with in, in more difficult circumstances that... I think if I had gone through that right away, I don't know, but then as I went through harder things, God poured out more grace. And whatever has come up, he's given the grace that I've needed at the right time, the strength I needed at the right time, and he, he'll do that for all of us, whatever it is that he's called you to do. However it is that he's called you to, to serve. And I don't, I don't force people into a place of service here. I don't go up to someone and tell them, you are going to do this here at this church. Because I don't necessarily know what God has created you to be. It's not so easy as it is looking at a human body and saying, that's an ear, I know you're supposed to listen. That's a mouth, you ought to be talking. Some people who have too big a mouth, they ought to be quiet. But <laughs> it's not that easy when dealing with people. See, I want people to serve where God has created them to serve. Because God has made you very specially. Very wonderfully. And he pours out the grace. And he gives the strength. And I love what the Apostle Paul says in 1 Corinthians 15, verse number 10. He says, but by the grace of God I am what I am. And his grace which was bestowed upon me was not in vain. But I labored more abundantly than they all. Yet not I, but the grace of God which was with me. He says, it was God's grace working in me that gave me what I needed to preach and to serve and to build and to work. He said, it wasn't me, it was God's grace. And that's what empowers each of us to do anything substantial for Him. Anything worthwhile, anything that's going to last has to be done by His grace. See, whatever I build in my own strength, it's not going to last. Whatever I build with my own power and intellect or whatever else, it's not going to work. But where it goes forth with God's grace, it has great power, great effectiveness. And the same is true for each one of us. So whatever it is that God has created you to be, He will empower you to accomplish that task with His grace.